I just want to start by saying thanks to everybody who's attending this evening. It's really a special opportunity to reach this audience. I want to start out by sort of addressing the title, 500 Years of Fire in Coastal Douglas Fir Forests. Um, I am going to venture into the coast range and talk about fire and forest development history there. But um, what our, our real subject is, is the coastal variety of the Douglas fir tree species. And so our research is um, aimed at better understanding how Douglas fir forest ecosystems develop over time and how that's influenced, influenced by disturbances like fire. And we're really covering that broad geography across the Western Cascades, and now we're moving into the Coast Range currently. Um, I wanna acknowledge uh, my co-authors, James Johnston, Matt Riley, Micah Schmidt, and Sven Rodney. And all of this research is being supported and conducted by the College of Forestry and the uh, Forest Services PNW Research Station. Uh, before I move on, can I get a thumbs up that everybody can hear and see me okay? Okay, awesome. So to start out, um, our, it's really hard to overstate the importance of our coastal Douglas fir ecosystems. Um, they're providing um, resources such as clean water, wildlife habitat uh, for threatened and endangered species, forest products, um, and they're enormously productive ecosystems that are critical uh, to storing carbon um, and, and mitigating the effects of climate change. Um, as you know, these Douglas fir forests have been significantly changed by intensive forest management over the last century, and they're changing today with disturbances such as wildfires. So we just had the 2020 wildfires. This is on our minds, and a lot of us are anxious about how we're going to manage and, and sustain these forest ecosystems and the services they provide into the future. So what we do here in the Tree Ring Lab is we learn how these forests develop and grow over time. Um, and so right now you're looking at an old growth Douglas fir forest in the Western Cascades. And what you're seeing is gaps where young seedlings are establishing. You're seeing 500 year old Douglas fir, 300 year old Douglas fir, and also some 150 year old hemlock. This stand has lots of diversity in vertical structure. So you've got a, a layered canopy, you've got these horizontal gaps, You've got lots of different age classes. And then another thing you'll notice is you've got lots of dead wood, so snags and logs. Um, so we're really interested in these old growth forest ecosystem types. Um, our question is how do they get to this stage? So a lot of what's shaped our thinking in old growth uh, for Douglas for forest ecosystems is these large um, high severity fire events that happened at long, that happened at long intervals. So for example, we have the Tillamook fire. This is a big fire, most of it stand replacing, and it's driven by um, really high east winds and really, really dry conditions. So that's shaped a lot about how we think Douglas fir forest ecosystems develop. And of course, that's been recently reinforced by the 2020 fires. So given that this is most of our experience with fire in Douglas fir forest ecosystems, this is sort of the standard accepted model we have for how these forests develop over time. It starts with a standard placing fire. We have snags left over and we get a Douglas fir cohort. Um, they, we then move into sort of a stem thinning or stem exclusion phase where the young trees start to compete with each other. Some of them start to die and then you get, uh, as the forest matures, some gaps that come in and you have hemlock and other species come into the stand. Um, what I want you to notice here is that this is a very linear pathway for Douglas fir forests to follow, and it's not interrupted by intermediate disturbances. So all of this is developing through time with only one big disturbance event, and everything else that happens in the stand is a within stand process. So it's all about trees competing with each other, dying slowly, and slowly growing into this old growth state. Um, for better or worse, this is pretty much our, our main model right now that we're applying to this forest type. Um, so back to, to what we're doing in the tree ring lab here. Um, as you might be aware, trees hold tremendous information inside of their rings. They not only tell us how old they are, they tell us about climate and different disturbance events. So in this cartoon here, you're seeing a fire scar on an old growth tree, but there's also things like insect epidemics, um, droughts, 
wind storms, ice storms, they're all reported in the trees, tree rings. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're using tree rings from very old trees to learn how forests develop over time. Uh, we often take cross sections out of dead trees to do this, or we can pour live trees to get a record out of them. Uh, just a shot of our lab. It's constantly full of cross sections from all over the Pacific Northwest. And we're carefully reconstructing lots of uh, different forest development histories across the state, with our focus being Douglas fir forest currently. One very important thing you guys need to know about our methods is that we are precisely assigning a year to every single tree ring that we're looking at. And so we do this by looking at a pattern of drought um, and wet years uh, that is imprinted in tree rings. So when you get a hot, dry year, you're going to get a very thin ring. And when you get a cool, wet year, you're going to get a fat ring. And this is putting a barcode in every tree in the Pacific Northwest. And that barcode is driven by climate at a very large scale. So you can take a tree from one stand and another stand and you can match up that barcode across trees. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to sample trees that have been dead for a very long time and know when they were established and when different events like fires happen. And so we're, we're able to take fire scars out of a tree and date them to their exact year that they happened. So this photo on the right here is showing you five different fire scars reported on a Douglas fir, and we're able to sign the exact calendar year to each one of those fires. And this is a really important step in what we're doing that hasn't been done before um, in Douglas fir forests in Oregon and Washington. Just a slide showing that right, right here. Uh, this is a map of the existing cross-stated forest development and fire histories in the region. Um, that map shows you the range of ponderosa pine, and you'll notice that all of our published studies here are right now in the ponderosa pine region. You're not seeing them in the Western Cascades or the Coast Range. So why is that? Uh, for a long time, there's a, a bunch of perceived reconstruction challenges to the Douglas fir region. Um, the thought is, is that it's a warm, wet place, and so our scars are going to rot, and we're not going to be able to recover them. It's very productive, so if trees did form fire scars, they'd grow over and heal them. Douglas fir have fire-resistant bark, so there's potential that they might not record fire. And then we have this overarching theory that stand-replacing fire is what's generally happening out there. And I think that causes us to say, hey, we don't really need to take this step because it's so much work. So why would we go out into the field and cut these cross sections to learn about fire in these forests if, if we don't have a lot of it and it's all just stand replacing? So for these reasons, um, what happened in the Douglas fir region is that we did um, spring counts on stumps. There are lots of clear cuts available in the 1980s and the 1990s. And researchers um, took that opportunity to go to these stumps and get ages off of them by counting rings in the field and then identify fire scars um, from those stumps. So right here in the photo, I'm showing you a, a, a picture of a stump um, in the field. It hasn't been sanded or polished or cross-stated, and you can see how tight the rings are, and this stump actually has four different fires reported on it. And what I want you to do is try to imagine you're in the forest sitting on the stump, and you're trying to precisely date every one of these rings. It's actually an impossible task and it has a tremendous amount of error. So what we got from these um, field counts on stumps is a realization that there was probably a lot of fire in these forests, but we, we didn't quantify it very well. And we also didn't really quantify how these forests developed over time. Um, when you don't have the exact year of fires, uh, you can't relate fires to climate. So you couldn't understand how climate contributed to fires occurrence. And you can't do some very basic and helpful things like estimate how large fires were or how frequent they occurred when you don't know the exact year. Um, one sort of method people have used to try and get around that is they just looked at tree establishment data. And if they had a, a bunch of trees establishing at one time, they assumed that a fire must have preceded that. The problem with that method is that when you use tree establishment dates, um, you only pick up about a third of the fires that happen in, in a forest over time. 
So moving on to what we're doing, um, the left side of this figure is showing you uh, fire history reconstruction sites across the Western Cascades in Oregon and Washington. Uh, this work started on the Umpaw National Forest and now we've moved all the way up into the Mount Baker Snoqualmie Forest in Washington. What we're basically doing is we're going to every one of these sites and we're sampling lots of old stumps and logs, cutting cross sections out of them and using those cross sections to reconstruct the fire years and when the trees established. Um, so uh, what you guys need to know about this, this new area that we're sampling, it's a lot wetter than anywhere else people have done fire history work in North America. So this graph is, is showing you um, temperature and precipitation uh, the top part of the graph shows wetter areas and the right part of the graph shows um, hotter areas. And the, the red small triangles are showing you published fire histories across North America and the big triangles are showing you where we're working currently. So we're working in, in forests that are much wetter than forests that have previously been studied in this way. So now I'm gonna um, move into showing you some results from the Western Cascades. Before I do that, I want to explain how to interpret these graphs. So right now I'm showing you a picture of a fire scar Douglas fir that's recording a fire in um, 1659 here. And um, I'm just going to walk you through the different pieces of information on this tree. So this circle here, that's going to show up on the graph. That shows you a tree establishment date. This fire scar here in 1659, that's going to be represented on the graph by a triangle. And then the timeline over which this Douglas fir recorded history is going to just be represented by a line. So to review, we have a circle to show you when the tree established on the graph. We're going to have triangles to show you fires the tree recorded. And we're going to have a line to show you the timeline where the tree was alive. So this is just an example graph. This is showing you about 15 Douglas fir sampled at one site. Um, each Douglas fir gets its own timeline. The circle represents when it's established, and then the triangle represents a fire. So what we have here is a stand that started establishing probably after a high severity fire sometime around 1775. And then that stand experienced a second fire right after the year 1800. So it burned at high severity and then it reburned when the young stand was developing. So now, right now, I'm going to move you into some specific data from a site in the Western Cascades. This is Site 71. It's located on the North Santa Am River, um, just east of the town of Detroit. And so in that photo, you're seeing um, one of the 2020 fires. It, of course, burned to this area at a high severity. And this site here, they had removed the trees that were next to the road. So we went and, and sampled these trees to develop a fire history for that part of the North San Am River that's right by the highway there. And so you're seeing one of the stumps in the foreground that, that I collected a cross section from. So we go to this site, um, we sample as many stumps as possible. What you're seeing here is all the stumps um, we collected at this site, and you're seeing lots of different fire scars recorded on those trees. And I think right here, I need to emphasize that the published fire return interval for this site is 200 years or, or longer, depending on what source you're looking at. But just looking at these cross sections, um, you're seeing lots of fire scars on those stumps, um, telling you that that site experienced a lot more frequent fire historically. So here's a graph reporting the fire and development history for that site 71 on the North San Am River. Again, each one of the trees we sampled has its own timeline. The circle tells you the year the tree was established and the triangles show you fire years. So what we have here are three different Douglas fir age classes. The oldest age class is established around 1640, probably after a severe fire. Um, in 1693, the stand has another fire, 1706, another fire, and you see the second cohort of Douglas fir come into the stand. Um, there's a final cohort that comes in after a fire in 1804, but the main takeaway I want you guys to see for this site is it doesn't follow our perceived model of how old growth Douglas fir forest developed. This forest developed with lots of low and moderate severity fire throughout its, its course of becoming a, a 350 year old Douglas fir forest. Um, it did not develop in the absence of low and moderate severity fire 
clearly it, it had lots of fire in it as it became old growth. Now I'm going to move you back to that site that I was talking about at the beginning of the pre presentation. This is site 23. It's at a much higher elevation in the Western Cascades. Uh, it's about 4,000 feet. And what you're seeing is a, a forest where the oldest trees established, I think, in the 1500s. But we'll see that in a second. So this is a history for a stand that's at a bit higher elevation. It's a bit cooler and wetter. And we went to this site, we sampled lots of trees, and here's the development history we got. So the oldest trees in this stand were established um, after a fire sometime around 1560. This site would have burned at high severity. And as it was developing, again, we see reburns of this site. So the initial Douglas fir pioneer cohort comes in, and then we have fires in 1615, 1626, and 1663. The interesting part about this stand is that it had quite frequent fire for about a century and a half. And then you see that long period without fire. So between 1663 and 1812, we didn't pick up any fire, even though we had sampled lots and lots of trees. And this is another sort of developmental pattern we find that is pretty common at these Douglas fir sites. They burn at high severity. When they're young forests, they burn, they reburn. And then as they develop into sort of a mature 150 year old forest, the fire frequency goes down. And sometime later, there might be another fire. In this case, that's in, in 1812 and 1846. Um, I guess the point of showing you this particular site is to tell you that fire events or, or fire frequency over time in Douglas fir forest is not stationary. You can have periods with quite a bit of fire and then you can go well over a century without fire. So often we think of like a fire return interval where it comes on a steady cycle. Um, but what we're seeing in Douglas fir forest is that's often not the case. You have periods with quite frequent fire and then you have long periods without fire. Um, we, we, we refer to that as a non-stationary fire return interval. It varies over time. I'm now gonna move on to showing you guys um, 22 different sites from uh, the Willamette National Forest. So I just showed you two sites from this area, and now I'm gonna show you 22 all at once. The point here is to emphasize the variability in fire frequency, fire effects, and development history in our coastal Douglas fir forest type. Um, so again, uh, what we have here is 22 sites. On this graph, we're showing time on the bottom axis, and then each site has individual timelines for all the trees sampled at it. Uh, the fires are again denoted by those red triangles. So this figure has a lot to digest. I want you to start at site 92, which is a stand established in the late 1200s. We only picked up one fire at that site. That site's gone about 700 years with no fire. Now what I want you to do is move up to site 82. Um, this is a stand that established in sometime after 1550. And look at the frequency of fire at that site. That site was burning frequently during its whole timeline. So within this relatively small area within the Willamette National Forest, you have an amazing range of fire frequency um, and fire effects over time. So you can have forests that develop with only one fire over 800 years, or you can have forests that are burning several times a century. The other point I wanna draw your attention to is that these forests are not all the same age. We've often heard that, you know, everything in the Douglas fir region was, was created by these really large high severity fires. And so we have huge areas where all the Douglas fir forest is the same age. But when you go in and you precisely age these stands, you see that moving from sample site to sample site, um, the forests are, are different ages. They might be 200, 300, 400, 500, or 800. So there's tremendous diversity in, in the, the oldest trees in the stand, and then tremendous diversity in how those stands have developed from the, the time they were created by a severe fire. And all that's related to having um, different rates of fire um, and different, different fire effects over time. So a couple of highlights here. What we're finding is that non-stand replacing fire was common in these Douglas fir forest ecosystems. 
there's clear evidence for standard placing fire, but um, we have low and moderate severity fire being very a very important process in these ecosystems as well. Um, we don't have strong evidence for really large high severity fires being the dominant process. It could be we need to sample more or sample at a different scale. It also could be that there's so much fire after the big stand replacing fire events that we're losing evidence over that of that event over time. In other words, if you had a big fire and the forest starts developing, other fires come in and remove evidence of that past fire. Um, I guess the main takeaway here is that our forest development um, is strongly influenced by, by low and moderate severity fire at a much higher frequency than we expected and that in most cases, our patches of high severity fire are smaller than we expected. So I just went into a, a lot on the Western Cascades and uh, recognizing that this is the Mid-Coast Watershed Council, I wanna move into the Elliott State Forest where we're doing research on how that forest developed over time and the nature of fire there on the Elliott State Forest. A little bit about our study design. Um, the Elliott State Forest is outlined. Um, sorry, I'm colorblind, I'm terrible with, with colors, but what you're seeing here is the Umpqua River next to Reedsport, Oregon. The Elliott Forest is just south of the Umpqua River. Um, and what we did is we sampled this area with a gridded study design. So we put 16 fire history plots overlapping the Elliott State Forest. And then within the Elliott, we're taking a deeper dive and sampling the age structure at a, at a finer scale. Um, what we hope to do is understand how fire moved across this part of the coast range historically and how diverse the age structure is within the Elliott State Forest. Um, we're just started starting on, on analyzing this data, um, but I do have a bit prepped for you tonight um, just to show you a few different stand histories. The first one I'm going to start with um, is it's our site 11. This is a fire history site and it's just to the west of Loon Lake if you're familiar with where Loon Lake is. Again our expectation for this area is that fire historically occurred at a 200 year return interval and that it was predominantly stand replacing. Um, so here's that fire history site, um, site 11. These are the cross sections that we have dated. Um, again, we're showing you tree establishment dates for the circle. We have a timeline for each tree and our red triangles are showing you the fire years. So this stand, um, I don't know its exact origin date. The oldest trees we've sampled so far were established in 1540 thereabouts. Um, and we see fire in 1628, 1663, 1674, 1712. Then we see a long gap without fire, which we often see in these stands. And then we see fire again in 1849, 1884, and 1892. Um, this is one of the first sites we sampled in the Elliott. Um, and I was genuinely surprised that we found this, this much fire and this many fire scars in the coast range. Um, I'm gonna move on now to showing you three sites all at once for the Elliott. So on our map there, I put stars over the, the sites that this data is coming from. The graph on the right is showing you the fire and development histories. Um, so we have site 11, which I just showed you on the previous page. And then site 15, we have uh, you know, um, fires there in 1770s and then 1841. And then site 14, we have fires in 1822, 1849, and 1868. So, um, what I'm showing you here in the coast range is that a lot of what we're seeing in the Western Cascades seems to also show up where we've sampled in the Elliott, where we have far more frequent fire than we expected. And a lot of that fire being low and moderate severity fire following a standard replacing fire event. So now I'm gonna sort of finish off by going back to our predominant model of how Douglas fir forest ecosystems develop over time. And again, this model is pretty simple. It says that we have stand replacing fire, a pioneer cohort comes in, it develops into sort of a, a 50 or 40 year old stand. It enters a stem exclusion phase where competition causes trees to die. You get gaps, hemlock and other shade tolerant species come into those gaps. And over time you develop this multi-layered forest 
with snags and logs um, and, and a mixture of species. And all of this happens in the absence of fire. What we're actually seeing here is that this standard model probably is useful in some areas, but lots of the Douglas fir region in the Pacific Northwest, it, it doesn't really explain what's going on there. Um, and that's because it's not incorporating um, the low and moderate severity fires that occurred in these forests and how they contributed to diversity and structure and composition over time. Um, so you could have a forest burn and have survivors in it um, at any stage. Um, sorry, I'm gonna back up here. Uh, one thing we see quite commonly is that after a fire, a young, a young stand in its early stage often re, uh, experience reburns or repeated fire. So it burns down at, at relatively high severity, and then in the following decades, it'll have reburns. And what this leads to is, is sort of a prolonged early seral stage and a forest that develops with a lot more diversity in tree cohorts and tree ages. It's also important to know that um, these forests could have burned at any age. So they didn't always just burn at old growth forest. They could have burned when they were middle-aged, intermediate ages, or as old growth forests. Um, I guess the point here is to note that our model of forest development is probably much too si simplistic for these Douglas fir forests, um, and that there are many different development pathways to reaching old growth. So in this photo here, I'm showing you three different stands. The one on the left has several Douglas fir cohorts or age classes, several different Western hemlock and grand fir age classes, and it's experienced chronic or repeated frequent fire over time as it became an old growth forest. The one in the middle there is a forest that burned at high severity. It reburned multiple times, and then it went through a long period without fire, and then it began burning again in the 1800s. And so what you're seeing in that photo is some large old growth Douglas fir from the pioneer cohort, cohort, and then lots of Western hemlock that actually date back to a fire in 1849. And I think that's an important point because we often think, well, the hemlock just come into these stands in the absence of fire because they're shade tolerance, but it's actually fire that gives them an opportunity to come into these forests in a lot of, in a lot of situations. So it's that, intermediate severity disturbance that opens the canopy and allows another cohort of trees to come in and create the diversity and structure and composition that we see in our older forests. Finally, that photo on the right is showing you a, a, a forest that's maturing and it's developed throughout its history without fire. So it was initiated by stand replacing fire and it hasn't been visited by fire again. Um, so again, the point here is that there's many different old growth development pathways in these forests. Just to emphasize that, um, another collection of 16 different uh, fire and development history sites in Douglas Fir Forest. Um, look at that graph. Notice how many different tree ages are represented on those 16 sites. They're all within the same watershed on the Middle Fork of the Lamb River but there's tremendous diversity in how old those forests are um, and how much fire they've experienced over time. Um, so instead of just sort of one development model, we should have lots of different development models in these forest ecosystems um, because they're adapted to a lot of different patterns of fire over time. Another uh, wrap up point here, um, our fire activity in our Douglas fir forest is non-stationary over time. That's a fancy way to say that the pattern of fire you see in one century may not be the pattern you see in the next century. We see forests that burned quite frequently for 100 to 150 years, then they can go multiple centuries without fire, and then they can burn frequently again. So um, the, we have uh, fire returnable sort of doesn't mean anything in this area. We can have frequent fire, we can have infrequent fire, and one century is not necessarily gonna look like the next. Other important point, um, reburns seem to be really common. So if we have a high severity fire, what we see is that that fire area will have multiple fires at higher frequency following that fire. We think this is related to the flammability of younger or early seral forests. So um, if you have a, a burned area, that's burned severely, you have 
lots of fat, flashier fuels, and you also have much higher temperatures and much lower humidity and higher wind speeds. So that's gonna be a much more flammable um, vegetation and, and microclimate than a mature or old growth Douglas fir forest. Um, beyond the tree ring work that we're doing, we actually have lots of written records and evidence that reburns are common and they're kind of the norm, not the exception um, in this forest type. So if you look at the Tillamook fire, it's initially a big stand replacing fire, most of it, quite a bit of it high severity, driven by east wind. And then in the decades after, we see lots of reburns. Same thing in the occult burn, really large fire pushed by east wind, lots of high severity effects. And then in the several decades after, it keeps reburning. So this is something that we see in the tree ring record and we also see in our records of, of really re relatively recent um, fires that were driven by east winds. So I'm um, gonna wrap up uh, just with some photos here. Um, we think of our, our Douglas fir forests as sort of these rainforests, temperate rainforests, lots of fog, and they rarely ever burn. Uh, today, when we walk through them, we're used to them looking like this without a lot of evidence or influence of fire. Um, but historically, our older or mature Douglas fir forests often were just as likely to look like this. Not always, but many of them had low and moderate severity fire in them and it was shaping them and a lot of the things we appreciate about these forests. So those things would be snags and logs, diversity in canopy structure, diversity in species composition, a more diverse understory. Fire was contributing to that much more often historically. Um, second, our young forests, they often look like this today, um, very uniform uh, in terms of species composition and structure. But historically, our young forests more often look like this. So they were being developed by fire. Um, and that early successional forest stage was much longer. It, it might have lasted up to a century in a lot of these places because they were reburning. Um, I'd like to acknowledge everybody who's been working hard on this study. It's a tremendous amount of work. And I think I went pretty fast there. That was a ton to unpack but I'm really happy to stick around for a while and, and go back to different slides and answer questions. Great, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, looks like we have uh, James on the Zoom call and he was doing some uh, real-time answering of the questions in the chat. So thank you, James, for doing that. Thanks, James. <laughs> So um, for the group, I, I think we will just still, um, I'll read out the question and then I'll read James' response. And then uh, Andrew, let you kind of fill in any more information if you uh, would like to. Um, so let me start here. So Becky asked, for each recorded fire at these sites, the red triangles, how many stumps were recorded for these fires? One stump, what was the spatial scale of these fires? Was it just a small fire? Do you think only sampling stumps could bias the fire history? What is the ignition source? And what are we thinking? Are we thinking natural or indigenous ignitions? And let me get the answer here. Uh, so James answered, Becky, note the horizontal lines. Those are individual trees. A triangle on that line indicates fire on that tree. We collected data within an area that was typically three to 10 hectares. It was generally only stumps that were available, usually clear cuts. We don't know what the ignition source was. Yeah, and just a clarification there, um, almost every fire we reconstruct is recorded on multiple trees. Um, and our fire scars, there are very, fire scars on a tree are a very distinct injury. They're, you can't confuse them with other agents of damage. So you can have mechanical damage to trees, frost damage to trees, there's lots of damaging agents. Um, I think I can show you this actually on a picture. So let me go back. So I think it's really important for people to know what a fire scar wound is. Uh, a fire comes through and it's burning through the forest and it goes to the base of the tree. And it's not actually burning through the bark of the tree. What it's doing is it's transmitting heat through that bark and it's killing the cambium. So that's that outermost layer of cells that's adding wood to the tree. And so a fire scar, um, the cambium is killed and the tree stops adding cells right there where the, 
the cambium was killed. And it's a very, very clean injury. If you look at the cells, they all stop in the exact same place. Um, and then what the tree does is it wraps around that injury where the cambium wasn't killed and it seals it up. And so what you're seeing here is that very, very clean injury and then the live part of the tree closing up that wound. Um, other agents of damage to a tree simply aren't clean. They go across multiple rings and they're not, you can't look under a microscope and see where the cambium was precisely killed. Um, so we're very confident that these are fire scars and the importance of sampling lots of trees over an area is to replicate them and make sure that they were fires that, that spread across the site we're, we're making inference to. Um, so let's see. Yeah, Bonnie and Russ asked, how do you factor cultural burning over time? And James answered, Dick and Bonnie, we're currently trying to investigate the potential role that indigenous people in sites where people lived for thousands, if hundreds, if not thousands of years, influenced fire ignition and fire patterns. But we don't currently have enough data to make strong inference, inferences about these questions. Yeah, and I, I could add to that a little bit. Um, right now we have site 82 on the, on the screen. You can see that there's a, a much higher frequency of fire at that site than some of the, the other sites in the Willamette. Um, I've observed similar things in the Umpqua National Forest. Um, I have a site at Oak Flat that is in the Western Hemlock Zone, but it has lots of sugar pine and ponderosa pine at it, which is very curious to begin with because it's way outside of where you'd expect to find that. And um, I found a three-year historical fire return interval there. Um, and those fires were not related to climate. They happened in both cool years and, and hot, dry years. And that's sort of an indicator of traditional burning being the explanation for why fire was so frequent at that site. So we expect our fires to be occurring in drought. That's not happening. And you're also seeing really, really high frequency at that site. It's a site of, of high cultural significance and use historically. And at that site, we're finding lots and lots of, of fire. So in those cases, we're, we're seeing strong evidence for traditional born, burning, but we haven't reached the point in our research where we can really talk a lot about that at broad scales, but we do see good examples of it. So Mark asked, uh, how will the warming, drying climate affect survival and regrowth of coastal forests? And James answered, Mark, exactly how climate change will influence vegetation uh, is an area of active study. The only answer, sorry, the answer is only as good as the models that provide the answer. And most of the models provide results at pretty coarse spatial scales. It's likely that warm and dry aspects and ridge tops will be more strongly affected by climate change than valley bottoms and other shaded topography, particularly, particularly rugged terrain near the ocean. Anything to add on that one, Andrew? Yeah, I think I like James's answer. <laughs> um, that, that gets really tough there. I think one takeaway for me is the enormous adaptability of Douglas fir. You know, it, it has such a big range in the Pacific Northwest because it can grow at sites with pretty low precipitation. You know, we're talking 25 inches all the way up to 130. Um, and what we're seeing is that it it persists in areas with very different disturbance regimes. So places that have frequent fire to places that don't have fire for 800 years. It's enormously adaptable to a wide range of conditions. And I think by looking at the ways different old growth forests developed, it might help us adapt to climate change as we start to see fire in areas where we didn't see a lot of fire in the past. Um, there is a model and a way for Douglas fir to adapt to that. One concern I've sort of had is that we just had these 2020 fire events. So really big, high severity fires, um, enormously impactful events in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of panic about will there be forest again? Is the Beachy Creek fire going to recover? Um, and you see, you know, maybe we're going to plant 30,000 acres of it. 
What I see in these records is that high severity fire happened historically. Those sites often reburned. And over a century, the Douglas first or first the ecosystem came back into being a Douglas fir forest. It took a lot of patience and, and people don't generally have that, but I wonder if we see a reburn in the Beachy Creek fire, are we gonna panic and attribute it to climate change? But there's a good historical precedent that we're gonna see reburns in those areas and a prolonged early successional phase. And the ecosystem is adapted to that. It's, it's happened before. So just a comment from Fran. Andrew, you're a very good presenter, educator. Lots of complex info presented very understandably. Thanks. <laughs> um, and then uh, Dick asks, um, I was at the Ho Forest, I assume up in uh, Olympic National Park up in Washington, several years ago and saw no evidence of fire. A U.S. Park Service person said fire. the forest was too wet to burn. The idea of plant succession says that it should develop into a climax forest. Thus, Douglas, uh, Menzies, etc., should have found vast hemlocks forests. Would fire and other disturbances account for the vast Douglas fir forests? And so sorry. Yeah, James answered. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, Andrew. James answered, Dick, in a word, yes. We often assume that prevalence of Douglas fir in the Pacific Northwest is a function of climate, but I think it may be related to fire disturbance. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, no, I was I was just gonna, I started reading James's comment aloud, sorry. Um, <laughs> we haven't sampled there yet. Uh, we're, we're starting off in Washington. I was there this week sampling on the GP um, and found really old Douglas fir forest with very little fire and found Douglas fir forest with quite a bit. So it seems to be extending into Washington. Um, I, yeah, I, I think that the challenging part is the, the prevailing knowledge is these forests just burn infrequently and at really long intervals. There's definitely part of the region that is that way, but it's not as pervasive as we thought. So Cindy asks, can you tell if a fire is caused by lightning um, using tree rings? And James answered, Cindy, short answer, no. All we know is that fire killed uh, cambium. Could have been lightning fire or fire ignited by people. So Allison asks, are you looking for volunteers? And James answered, we sometimes work with volunteers. <laughs> so. And just one more here. Uh, William asks, although we know forest fires can be devastating, can you give an example of how fires can benefit the Douglas fir forest? James answered, William, fire has multiple effects to ecosystems that depend on topography fuel conditioning, weather during the fire, and much more. There's no one answer about how fires benefit forests, but at this point, we know that these forests did experience lots of fire, which may have played a role in developing complex forest structures. Can I um, address another question from earlier sure. real quick? Yeah, good. So Becky had a good question about the extent of the fires we reconstructed. And when we divide, designed our sampling scheme, the prevailing knowledge was that fires in the Western Cascade should be really, really extensive. So we just put out random plots across the area and they're quite, they're, they're spaced pretty far apart. What we're not seeing is a lot of shared fires at really big scales. Um, what that's telling us is that a lot of fires historically were 5,000 to 10,000 acres. So they weren't super, super extensive. And I put this graph on the screen to sort of get at that. I want you guys to look at figure A, which is showing you sort of everything west of the Cascades in Oregon and Washington. And it's showing you um, A, B, C, and D, the lowercase figures, um, really large east wind driven fire events. And then the, there's lots of smaller polygons in red. Those are fires in the year 1910. 
And you see that those fires, there's tons of them and they're not very big. And then if you look at um, figure C, it's showing you the size class of, of fires that we have maps for. And what you see is that most of the fires um, from this record, 61 of them are about 5,000 hectares in size. So a lot of the fire and a lot of the work by fire in Douglas Fir Forest was done by these smaller fires, 5,000 to 10,000 acres. And they had a mixture of high severity fire, moderate and low severity fire in them. Um, so I think what we're finding is not a lot of evidence of really huge fires, but lots of evidence for these, these five to 10,000 acre fires. One other way I can get at that is I've sampled fire history on, on grids, and that's the way we're sampling in the Elliott, where we space our sample sites much closer together. So you can space them a kilometer apart or five kilometers apart. And when we sample at a finer scale, we see lots of agreement between fire years. So currently we're not seeing that for our sample scheme in the Western Cascades, but when you sample at a finer scale, long story short, you do see a lot of agreement in fire years between points. All right, Becky, <laughs> thanks you for the nuanced answer. Uh, Nancy says, excellent presentation. Um, I think we'll just do um, one more here. Jordan asks, are there things in common between sites with moderate fire intervals across the Pacific Northwest, slope, aspect, elevation, et cetera, that can clue us into the appropriate intervals for prescribed burns and future management strategies? That's uh, an excellent and, and very important question that would really make this work more applied. That's the going to be the next step in our analysis is to look at how these different fire histories relate to things like topography, precipitation, um, you know, where we expect traditional burning to occur to try and explain some of this variability. I'm, so, I, I'm sorry that we're presenting that and we're not yet there, um, but that's definitely the next phase is to understand what's driving some of this variability. Um, I, I'm sort of hypotheses based on what I've seen in the field and where these sites are at. And I was sort of alluding to them. When you're at a low elevation site that's next to a major river, you often see pretty frequent fire in these forests. When you're in sort of a mid elevation, moderate moisture site, that's where you start to pick up these sites with frequent fire followed by a long interval. So I've got some general patterns, but long story, we haven't done the analysis and we'll be happy to update when we do. All right, I, I think there's a couple more coming in, but I think we'll cut it off there. Um, I think, Andrew, if you wanna go back to the slide that had your email address there, um, maybe if folks have other questions, they can uh, follow up with you directly, but um, I think we'll, for now, uh, say thank you, Andrew, and thank you, James, for answering questions in real time. That was kind of fun. Um, thanks for taking the time this evening, Andrew, and, and sharing this research. And um, I think, yeah, I think a couple years down the road, and we'd like to have you back and, and get an update about this and um, maybe have you out to the Midcoast and, and, and tour some of our forests with you as well. So, um, yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone. Andrew. Great questions. Thank you.